Well, um, uh, today we launch a brand new series, and uh, I'm very excited about it. It's a, a series entitled Driven, and it's all about our faith in action. And uh, how many of you out there uh, just uh, wish you could deepen your faith in a, in a way this, this summer, this year, that you could take that next step in your faith? How many of you want to grow in your faith this year? How many of you wish that you could just deepen your faith in a way that you could share the gospel message even more effectively this year? How many of you want to be that person? Then some of you out there, you just may be asking questions about who is Jesus Christ and and what does this Christianity really mean for for me? And so as we go through this series, we're going to learn all kinds of great things about all of those questions and much more. And today what we're going to do, I want you to go ahead and get your Bibles ready. We're going to talk about what it means to ignite our faith and to be driven to serve. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Now, we've talked about this subject at the, the, near the end of last year, and we're going to come back to this text because we're going to look at it from the aspect of what it means to be driven to serve the Lord, especially as we go into these summer months, as we have this next week coming up with the, the 4th of July and so many people coming into Cicero, Indiana. How many of you want to have that desire to serve for the glory of God this week? Anybody out there? So this week, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to prepare you for all the great activities, but we're going to prepare you spiritually as to what that means. Now, in order to do that, what we got to do is we got to go back to 1999. Yeah, that's right. We got to go back to 1999. How many of you remember 1999 really well? And you're like, uh, nothing great happened there for me, right? Well, 1999, I remember that there was a time that I... uh, as a young man, I liked to race, and I would race anything and anyone, and I really thought that I was the best at what I was doing no matter what, and so I thought, you know what, I can win this race even though I've never done this race before. I knew I could win it, but boy, I love to drive fast. Uh, how many of you could relate to that? Uh, where's Ron McGill? Ron McGill, you could relate to that, am I right? Just recently, if I, I'm just joking, just joking, but but um, but. We can relate. How many of us have ever had that competition attitude that you just wanted to win? You wanted to win. Anybody been there? Well, 1999, I had that attitude in a great way. And and so anybody that would challenge me to any race of any kind, then I I wanted to win it. So there was this time that that, uh, a group of friends, we got together, and we wanted to have a a go-kart race. And so we went to one of these these really nice go-kart tracks, and they, they had the flag, and they had the laps, and they did everything. And so I got in there, and I knew these guys, and I knew their their tactics, and I knew their techniques. And so I was determined, I was driven to win. How many of you have been there? I mean, I knew my competition. And so I got behind the wheel of that car, and I was waiting for that flag to drop. And I just knew, I knew I could win this. And as soon as that flag dropped, man, I drove with great intensity. I took every curve as fast as I possibly could. I tried to break at just the right time, accelerate at just the right time. And then I quickly realized, man, I am a terrible go-kart driver. I mean, I really am. And suddenly I realized that, that I was in last place. And lap after lap after lap, I started getting farther and farther behind. And I thought to myself, I really don't know these guys. These guys are good. And then I realized, you know what? I think these guys were trying to fool me. I think they were getting me out here on purpose to beat me. And then the last lap came. I came in very last place, and I realized something very important on that day. Number one, I was a terrible go-kart driver. But number two, what I realized was that in order to be driven to win, it doesn't just take a good attitude. Am I right? It doesn't just take good intentions. It doesn't even take a good desire. But in order to be really driven to win, then I need to train myself on how to run the race or win the race. I need to make sure that I know the rules of the race and I know when to break and when to accelerate or or when to pass and, and when to go. But I also understand that I need to be prepared for the race. That I need to be prepared in heart, mind, and soul. And you know, I think about that because our faith is very much like that, isn't it? 
that there are some times that we go out in this world and we know logically what we need to be doing. Am I right? We really know that we need to be the salt and the light. And we know logically that we need to share our faith. And we know logically that we should do this and this and this. But how many of you at any time in your life have ever been paralyzed by the what ifs? Anybody? Have you ever been paralyzed by the what ifs? What if? What if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Have you ever asked that? What if they reject me? What if, what if they don't like me? What if they stop being my friend? And suddenly what we understand is the what ifs, they paralyze us. And I know many Christians that even though they know logically that God's called them to be driven to be the salt and the light, to be driven to serve, they're so paralyzed by the unknown, they're so paralyzed by the what ifs, and to be honest, they haven't trained themselves. They haven't prepared themselves. And so they drop out of the race. Or even worse, they refuse to believe that there's even a race going on whatsoever. And they pull off into the pit lane and they just stop. They just stop completely. Well, God has great things in mind for you. And God has a great plan for you in your life. But that means that God wants you to follow him, trust him, obey him, and yes, serve him. To be driven to serve to train yourself on how to serve, to to know how to serve, to prepare yourself how to serve. But God wants you to be out there being the salt and the light because it will make an eternal difference in the lives of so many. And so today, as we begin looking at this text, it's a text that prepares us, a text that prepares us to ignite our faith and to be bold in sharing God's love and his truth and that gospel message with anyone that will hear it. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand with me. We're going to look at Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. As we begin looking at this text, there are three very important truths to ignite your faith that are seen in these verses. Three very important truths that are given to us by Jesus Christ. Let's look at what they are. Would you follow along with me as I read this text today? Jesus would declare these words to his disciples and those that would be gathering around him seeking the truth. And he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city or a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Would you bow your heads with me and let us pray for a moment. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be the salt and the light. We thank you for the opportunity to give you glory and praise this day and this hour. I pray, Father God, that you would quicken our hearts and our minds, that you would compel us Throughout the course of this week, as so many come in to this town, as so many come into Cicero, Indiana, that we would be prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And that we would not be ashamed of the gospel. That we we would share the truth of eternal life with each and every person that would be willing to listen. And so this day, may you be honored by the desire of our heart and by the pursuit of our life. May you give us an understanding of your word that we might truly be equipped to give the gospel with the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people say, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for the word of God today. The big idea that we're going to examine here today that we're going to be wrestling with through the course of our time together is simply this, you can make an eternal difference. Each and every one of you can make an eternal difference, but that's only if you choose to be the salt and the light. What I've noticed over the years is that as we go through this life, so many of us as Christians, we know what we should be doing logically. We read the Word of God and we look at it and we say, okay, very simple. God tells us to share His truth, so we should share His truth. 
God tells us to serve as he is, as Christ has served. So, so we serve as Christ has served. We, we look at the word of God, and over and over again, we understand the great importance of going and making disciples, of baptizing, of teaching and training them on what it means to obey the word of God. And we understand all of those principles, but there's a little trick in all of this. And that little trick that, that, that we encounter, the obstacle, maybe it's better to say, that we encounter is the fear of the what-ifs. How many of you have ever been paralyzed by the what-ifs in life? When we go out to share our faith, sometimes those what-ifs are simply something like this. What if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever been there? Or what if they reject me and reject what I have to say? What if they decide from that moment forward that they no longer want to be my friend? Or they no longer really want me to associate with them? And over and over again, so many times, what paralyzes us from serving the Lord and what paralyzes us from simply sharing our faith is the fear of the what ifs. But see, God, God doesn't want you to have to be afraid. God has told us and he has promised us that we are not alone. That we are not alone in this life, we're not alone in this world, especially as we serve Him. And that we really don't have anything to be afraid of. And that in that time when we need the right words to say, if we are following Him and serving Him, and, and we have prayed and we have prepared and we are ready to practice, then He gives us just the right words to say. And we've been there, each and every one of us that has truly grown in our faith, we have been there. And so as we begin looking at this text, we are reminded of the calling that you and I have to serve. Even in spite of our fears, we are called to serve. We're called to serve this day, we're called to serve this week. We are called to be the salt and light, which means we are called to make a difference in this life for Jesus Christ. Now as we begin looking at this text, we understand that it's occurring right in the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever delivered to mankind. And Jesus is up there and he is preaching on this hill and he's preaching to his disciples and he's preaching to his followers about the, the marching orders of what it really takes to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Or in our case, what it really takes to be a, a devoted servant of the Lord. He starts out in Matthew chapter 5 verses 3 through 12. And he gives certain characteristics that are needed for you to live a godly lifestyle. And he calls those the Beatitudes, and he says, blessed are you if you choose to live this life, if you choose to take on these character traits. And then he comes to verse 13 through 16, and he makes a transition here, and he says this. He says, now that you have all these character traits down, here's what it looks like for you now to put your faith into action, to be driven to serve. And he starts out, and he begins giving these three truths about what it means to ignite our faith in order to serve the Lord. And the first truth comes to us right here in verse 13. And as we look at verse 13, Jesus starts out with these words, and he says, you are the what? You are the salt of the earth. And it's interesting because sometimes we begin looking at that phrase, and it doesn't really mean a lot to us. We kind of get lost in, in what we view as the importance of salt. When you think of the importance of salt, what do you think of today? In your own life, when you look at salt, what do you think of? Flavor? Okay. What else? Okay, preservation? Okay. Okay, preserving? Okay, what else? Anything else? Some people look at salt and they say, well, I, I like to add it to foods. I like to add it to um, uh, medicine sometimes if I have to gargle salt water, whatever the case may be. But we look at salt, and how many of you look at salt and you say, Wow, this is one of the most valuable things I have on my shelf. And you are willing to pay everything if that's what it would take to get salt. Anybody? No, you're not willing to do that most of the time, am I right? Not in today's culture. And so when we look at this, we say, you're the salt of the earth. Okay, so is Jesus saying we're ordinary? Is Jesus saying we're just commonplace and that's it? No, actually in the days of Jesus, the understanding of salt meant something much deeper. And we need to have a, a better understanding of that even in our own culture today. You see, it's really important that we understand that, that salt was of great, great value to the culture at the time. There was one commentator that he observed the great value of salt in this way, and he said, actually, during a period of ancient Greek history, it was called theon, which meant divine. The Romans held that except for the sun nothing was more valuable than salt. 
often Roman soldiers were paid in salt. And it's actually from that little uh, um, a tradition that we get the phrase, you're not worth your what? You're not worth your salt. You see, when Jesus was telling his followers and his disciples that you are the salt of the earth, what he was saying is, you are valuable. You are more valuable than anything else out there. And I want you to understand that, that you are valuable. Now, I don't care what culture you're from. I don't care what time frame you're living in. I don't care what nation you're from. How many of you out there love to understand and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are valuable? Anybody out there? I mean, really, anybody out there? Do you love to know and understand and be told that you're valuable? Yes or no? We all do, right? I mean, every one of us. And so when we look at this, we have to rearrange our thinking just a little bit. And we have to understand that, that not only is Jesus telling his disciples in his day and his followers of his day, but he's also telling you and me. If we want to carry out the marching orders of Christ and be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, then we need to understand what it means to be the salt of the earth, to be valuable. Now, there are two very, very important truths that we understand from this phrase, and sometimes we don't readily observe them. The very first truth that we see here is that when he says you are the salt of the earth, he's not just saying you singularly. He's not just pointing out one individual. He's not just saying, Keith, you are the salt of the earth, or you are the salt of the earth, or you are the salt of the earth. When he's saying you are the salt of the earth, he's talking about the collective body of Christ as a whole, all of the followers that have gathered together. So it would be like like us here at Cicero Christian Church saying, you, Cicero Christian Church, you're going to be reaching out to the community during the 4th of July, right? So it's a collective body. Some of you may be actually volunteering, and some of you may be praying for those volunteers, but each one of us plays an important part, am I right? And so when he begins saying this, we have to understand right away that he's saying you, as a body of Christ, you are extremely valuable. You are of great value in the eyes of the Lord. But then this this you that he utilizes, it's also emphatic. And what that means is that he's saying, by the way, not only are, are you valuable, but you are the only salt of the earth. There's no other like you. There's no other salt that can compare to you. You are the only salt of the earth. Now, what does it mean to be the salt of the earth then? When we begin looking at this, there have been many that have looked at this analogy and they've tried to come up with their own conclusions. They they look at this analogy and they say, well, salt is white, and so therefore it represents purity. And so therefore, Christians are called to uh, be uh, this uh, uh, purity, this, this representing purity in this war- dark world or in this world that is so desperate need of an example of purity. Then there are some out there that say, well, no, 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 salt, salt, it adds flavor to a, a certain substance. And so Christians, we are called to be those that are adding divine flavor to the world. And then some will look at this characteristic or look at this analogy and they will say, no, 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 salt actually stings when you put it on a wound. How many of you have been there? Okay. Salt stings like really badly when you put it on a wound. And so as Christians, we are called to sting the world and prick its conscience and make it uncomfortable in the presence of God's holy gospel. And some have have observed that and they've said, no, no, this is the meaning. And still some say, well, no, no, salt, it creates thirst. And so God intends for his people, his followers, to live and testify before the world so that others will be made more aware of their spiritual dehydration and the danger that that holds. And so there have been all kinds of speculation over the years as to what Jesus was really referring to. And all of those hold some very valid truths. But there is one that if we look at the context, there is one that I think best fits what Jesus is trying to say. And as we begin looking, some of you had already given the answer. As we begin looking at the importance of salt, not only in Jesus' day, but also in our day, we see that salt is used for preservation. As Christians, we are called to be a preserving agent in this world. Have you ever looked at yourself in that way? That you are actually called to preserve a standard of morality and a standard of righteousness in a world that, let's face it, does the world have kind of a convoluted view of morality and righteousness right now, yes or no? And so Christians, we are called to actually take a stand 
And we are called to proclaim the gospel truth, not a false gospel, not a, not a, a warped gospel, but we are called to proclaim the gospel truth and even stand for that truth when we need to so that we can be a preserving agent for even the generations ahead. So that they would understand what true Christianity looks like, what it really looks like to follow Jesus Christ. I remember um, that as we began looking at this text, I came across a commentator. And this commentator had made a very important observation. And he said, if you look closely at this, not only does Jesus tell you that you are to be the preserving agent, not only does he tell you that you are to be the salt of the earth, but he does something else here. He says, not only, look at it one more time, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, it's interesting because Jesus never says that as a Christian you stop being the salt. That there might come a day when you stop being the salt. But what does he say? As Christians, if you're not taking a stand for the truth and you're not proclaiming the truth and you're not preserving righteousness and a, a standard of true biblical morality, if you're not doing those things in your life, are you losing your saltiness according to Jesus, yes or no? Yes. And as we begin losing our saltiness, what we understand is that what happens is we become being of less and less value to the kingdom of God. Now we look at that and we say, well, what are you saying? Are you saying God doesn't value? No, no, no. Remember, you are of infinite value to God. But God has an important calling for you, has an important role for you, and he wants you to be of great value to the kingdom of God. And what that means is that if you're not spreading the gospel, then who's going to hear the good news? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, just think about that for one moment. If you're not standing for the truth today, who is? Let's say that every Christian in our country decides, no way, I'm not going to be a preserving agent. When I am encountering a, 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 a warped view of morality, when I'm encountering, encountering a, a false gospel, instead of taking a stand, it's just a lot easier for me to look the other way and pretend that it's not even there. Right? For many, that's their perspective. But what if every single Christian in our country, what if every single Christian in our world said, no way, I'm not going to choose to be a preserving agent? What would happen? What would happen? What do you think? Destruction? And no one would hear the word? And if no one's hearing the word, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, can they grow in faith? Because faith comes by hearing what? Hearing the word. And if they're not hearing the word, if they're not even being introduced to Jesus Christ, if they're not even being introduced to a saving gospel, then ultimately what's happened? People are being destroyed eternally. You may have never thought about the great importance of you being the salt of the earth right where you're at. But Jesus says, it is of that kind of value. You are of infinite value right where you're at. You are of infinite value to be a preserving agent. And let's face it, we take a stand in all kinds of different ways, all kinds of different situations. It's not always the same in every single instance. But every one of us have been called to truly stand for the truth. And to see what that may look like in our own lives we're facing that as a very real reality right here in Indiana right now, aren't we? When it comes to the subject of homosexuality and the federal courts going ahead and overturning the ban on, on homosexual marriage. And so some of you, you might be asked questions this week on, on what does the Bible really say on that subject. And so what we've done here, to, in order to equip you with the truth, we've provided a little booklet. You can get it right out here in the information booth. And if you want to know more about the subject of homosexuality, what does the Bible really say about it so you can take a stand? So that you can be out there and that you can truly give a reason for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ and do it in love and do it in truth and in the hope that, that you would win others to Jesus Christ, then you're going to want to pick up one of these booklets. Take it home with you and study so that you can be prepared to stand. Be prepared to stand for the truth and not just simply look the other way. One of my favorite passages of Scripture it's found in Ezekiel 22, verse 30. And I want you to, to look at this text just for a moment, and I want you to ask yourself, does this speak to our culture or what? Look at what God says to Ezekiel. I looked for someone, just anyone, one person, who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. I searched for 
someone, just one person, one individual, man, woman, child, whatever it would be, to stand in the gap, in the wall, so that I would not have to destroy the land. But what does he say? But I what? I found no one. My prayer is that that would never become a reality for our own country. How many of you would like for that to be that prayer, that this would not become a reality for our own country? And that we would see God raising up many, many, many different individuals that would stand in that gap in a variety of places, in a variety of ways, and declare the truth. In Proverbs 19, 21, it says, Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that's ultimately going to stand. Man's plans will fail, but God's plans will always stand. And then finally, in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, it reminds us that we are to be watchful. We are to stand firm in the faith, and we are to act like men. We are to be strong. Because in order to take your stand and be the, the preserving agent, are you going to need the strength of the Lord? What do you think? Yes or no? We are. So I really challenge you, I really challenge you to pray for the people in this room right now. Pray for the people in this church that God would just give them the courage and give them the strength and even give them the words to take a stand for his truth. If you do nothing else for the remainder of this week, at least pray that God's people would take a stand. Truth number one, write this down, some in your notes. You serve by the way you stand. Choose to be the salt. Whatever you do this day, be driven to be the salt of the earth. Be that preserving agent. And so whatever it takes, just stand. It may be costly, but you will be blessed by the Lord for that eternal reward. Stand. Be the salt. The next truth that we examine comes to us right here in verses 14 through 15. And again, we, we see that emphatic you again, right? He says, not only, by the way, are you a preserving agent, but you are also the light of the world. A city on a hill, it can't be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on its stand. And it gives light to all in the house. Now, this is really important to understand what Christ is talking about here. Now, I want you to think about the sun and the moon for just a moment. Some people, they look at the moon, and, and if they don't know that much about science or, or know that much about, uh, about uh, just the, the way God has designed the universe, they might look at the moon and they say, wow, look at how bright the moon is. Look at how much light it's given off tonight. Now, let me ask you a question. Does the moon itself actually produce and give off any of its own light, yes or no? No. Actually, the moon, it reflects the light of who or what? It reflects the light of the sun. As Christians, we are called to do the same thing, are we not? We are actually called to reflect the light of the sun, the light of Jesus Christ. And so when he says, you are the light of the world, what he's saying is, you are to be reflecting the light of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ. And by the way, not only are you the only salt of the earth, but you are also the only what? You're the only light of the world. There is no other way to be saved but through Jesus Christ, right? And so you have that message. And you get to share that message by the way you live, by the way you act, by the way you serve, by what you say and what you do. All of us get to share that message. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty cool. Am I right? I mean, we get that opportunity. And we get that opportunity day after day to honor the Lord. What's interesting is in order to let your light shine, in order to reflect the light, then there are two very important truths that Jesus gives us here in this text. You see, the very first truth that, that Jesus relates to us is that if you choose not to be the light, then darkness will consume others. And it may just even consume you. I mean, have you ever thought about that just for a moment? What would happen if you chose not to reflect the light of Christ? Not to serve like Christ, not to love like Christ, not to, to, um, uh, to sacrifice like Christ? Have you ever thought about the significance of what would happen if you choose not to do that? Now, in Luke, in Luke chapter 11, verses 34 through 35, it tells us this. It says, your eye is a lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. In John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How many of you have ever used a flashlight I'm going to 
just caution you on this, a flashlight that actually works. How many of you have ever used one of those? We all have about 50 of those flashlights that don't have batteries or aren't working in the house, am I right? And you're always looking for the one that works. Now, how many of you have ever used a flashlight that actually works, that the power supply is right on, it's working, and you turn it on in the middle of a dark room, and let's say you shine it on uh, a chair. Now, what happens when you turn that flashlight on and you shine it on that chair? What happens? What happens? Well, you can see the chair, number one, right? Before, you couldn't see it because it was clouded in darkness, right? Now you can see it, but, but what else happens? Can you see any obstacles between you and the chair or any obstacles around the chair? Yes or no? Yeah. But here's the other thing that sometimes we overlook. When you turn that flashlight on and you shine it on the chair, what happens to the darkness? It runs away. Flees to the very outer edges of the light, am I right? Because if you understand and you look at this, and we know this logically, we understand that light and darkness can't be in the same place at the same time. That one will always rule over the other. And by the way, we know which one always rules, always prevails over the other. And what is that? It's always light, isn't it? It's always light. And so when we think about this, how valuable we are as Christians, as the light of the world, I mean, think about this. We are called to reflect the light of Jesus Christ and that nothing can overcome that light. Isn't that great? But if we're not reflecting that light, what happens? The darkness it consumes. It consumes others. Sometimes it may even start creeping into your own life if you choose not to stand, if you choose even maybe to try to ignore it, it's even there. And so we are called to be that light, to reflect the light of Jesus Christ in this life. The second point that Christ makes is not only must you choose to be the light, but you must not hide the gospel truth. You must not keep it to yourself. I mean, when we look at this, look at what he says. He says, you don't shine a light or turn a light on and then hide it for yourself. Just like a city on a hill can't be hidden. You don't light a lamp and put it, under, uh, put it in a closet or put it under a bed so no one else can see it. He said, why would you do that with the gospel message? Why would you do that with the love of Jesus Christ? Go out there and share it with anyone and everyone that will listen. Go out there and be the salt and the light. In whatever way it may take, whatever way it may be, God has so many amazing ways you can be the salt and light. I could stand up here and I could give you a thousand probably of the different ways. But I bet if you just prayed, if you just prayed for God to show you one way this day, that he would begin opening doors for you. Try it and see what happens. It's interesting because here we see in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 that it says, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That you and I, we've been given the light, the knowledge of the word of God, the knowledge of who to give glory to, and we are called to share it. Truth number two, write this down. You serve by what you radiate. Be the light. What are you reflecting in your life right now? If someone were to ask, if someone were to come up and show you or tell you the example that you're giving off, would they say that you are radiating the life of a Christ follower? Or would they say that you are radiating the life of someone that's just like everyone else in the world? You serve Christ by what you radiate, by the example that you give and live. What is that example in your own life? The final example that we come to, the final truth is found in verse 16. And it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus gives us two very important outcomes as to what it means to be the light of the world and truly to be the salt of the earth. And I want you to think about this because some of you out there, you may think to yourself, well, why, why would I want to go through all this trouble being the salt and the light? I mean, why would I go through all this trouble of possibly being rejected? Why would I go through all this trouble of people possibly not liking me? Here's why. Look at what he says. There's two outcomes. There's two reasons why you absolutely need to be the salt and the light. 
He says, number one, share your light. Once again, he reiterates that again. Whatever you do, share that light. But he says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Now, that Greek term for good here is an interesting term. It's not talking about quality, but it's talking about attractiveness. Now, I want you to think about that. We don't always think about our example or our good works or our good deeds in that way. But what Jesus is saying is that we are to live our life in such a way that people would look at our example and they would be attracted to Jesus Christ. That they would be attracted to know more about what it means to live a life like you. Otherwise, that they would ultimately be attracted to the the works, that they would be attracted to see what it is that makes you different. And that's the the second outcome that he points out. I mean, look at this. Not only are they called to see your good works. So so again, you you are called to have faith in action, right? You're called to live out of your faith so that others may see Jesus Christ at work in your life. But he says, not only are you to do that, but that also that they would be driven to give God glory because of your life. Have you ever thought about that? That the way you live your life matters more than you could ever imagine. And that we are called to live our life so that other people, sometimes complete strangers, that they would give glory to God that you were in their life for that day. How many of you have ever praised God that someone just came alongside of you at just the right moment? Maybe it was a stranger, maybe it was a a friend, maybe it was a family member, but they came into your life at just the right time and they encouraged you. They lifted you up, they prayed for you at just the right time. And you just thanked God that they were there that day. How many of you have ever been there? Anybody? But we are called to live this kind of life. We are called to live this kind of life where people would look at our lives. They would look at our example. They would look at the way we even engage with them. And they would say, praise God for someone like this. Praise God for someone that's living out their faith, for being the salt and the light. Praise God for you being in my life today. So I want to challenge you to think about what that looks like for you. Again, we've used this example a million times, but how easy it is to pray for your waiter or your waitress and tell them, ask them, just simply say, hey, how can I be praying for you today? Just to go out there and and to to come alongside of of the cashier or the the gas station attendant or, or whatever the case may be and just simply come up to them and say, hey, how could I be praying for you today? Or to come up and encourage them in some way, encourage them and say, how great of a job they're doing. How many times have you really taken that initiative and said, today I just want to be the salt and the light, but, but more importantly than just being nice, more importantly than just being encouraging, I want to draw them to know more about Jesus Christ. We're called to be the salt and the light. And that's not a one-time deal. That's a lifelong pursuit. There are people that I've been working on five years. And I'll work on them until the day that I die. There are people that you need to be praying for right now. There are people that you need to be encouraging right now. But it's your choice. You must choose to be the salt and the light. And so as we look at this, ask yourself, this day, how am I living my life that others are giving God glory simply because I'm in their life? Truth number three, write this down. You serve by the fruit of your pursuit. Give glory to God. You serve by the fruit of your pursuit. What are you pursuing in this life? What is the fruit fruit that you're producing? And are you giving glory to God? Now there is a three-step plan that we're going to encourage you to implement. You can see it on our website, and you can find some some links here as well. And the three-step plan that we're going to encourage you to implement through the course of this series is simply this. It's a test drive, this three-step plan. It is a step number one, pray. To, to pray that God would open the doors and open your eyes to those opportunities for you to serve. Number two, it is to prepare. It is to study the Word. We have a, a link on our website that you can go to a, a website that will give you numerous Bible reading plans. And you can choose from one of those plans and just start somewhere. But begin preparing yourself so that you can give a reason for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And then finally, step number three, practice. Pray, prepare, and practice, or otherwise put your faith into action.